Content warning. The Matherson marriage contains unhealthy relationship dynamics and fictional domestic abuse. If you are in a real-life Matherson marriage, please reach out to the appropriate authorities for help. Resources you may find helpful include the Pixel Project's Domestic Violence Resource page and UN Women's International Helplines list. Resources will be linked in the video description for accessibility. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I will be reading from The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Chapter 23 Matherson stood outside his wife's room, breathing fast. He knew all he had wanted to know at last. His wavering suspicions were confirmed. He had read the truth in Pansy's eyes, and he was half mad with jealousy as, presently, he moved and went along to the nursery. Pansy loved Ramsden. The truth seemed shouted at him from every corner of the house as he opened the nursery door and saw Joyce sitting at the table mending one of Buster's socks. He spoke abruptly. I shall not be requiring your services any longer, Miss Lindsay, he said roughly. I am shutting up the house and taking my wife and son away indefinitely. You can leave tomorrow, and I will pay you two months' salary instead of the usual notice. Joyce rose to her feet. For what reason, Mr. Matherson? she asked quietly, though she was white to the lips. For reasons which I prefer to keep to myself, he answered curtly. There was a moment's silence. Then, very well, she said. Matherson turned on his heel. The blood was hammering in his veins. It had pleased him to see the shock in Joyce's steady eyes. He would show them who was master, he told himself in triumph as he went downstairs. Violet, Pansy, Joyce, all of them. There was soft pity in his heart that rose above his rage and hurt pride. He felt that he had been shamefully treated. He had always behaved well to Pansy, and he had kept open house for Ramsden. He had trusted them both, and they had abused that trust. He sat up all night drinking and nursing his grievances. He reminded himself that he had loved Pansy devotedly, and that she had never returned his love. She had always put everyone before him. She had worshipped Buster. Well, he would have his revenge. His muddled brain clung tenaciously to that. He would have his revenge on them someday, somehow. It was his last thought when towards morning he fell into a heavy sleep from which he was only roused by the servants moving about the house. He woke cold and shivering, but with the sense of injustice still in his heart. He hated Ramsden. God, how he hated him. He went out, untidy and hatless as he was, and down to the garage. Gates stared when he saw him. Sir, is anything wrong? He asked in dismay. Wrong? Matherson gave vent to his feelings in a flow of bad language, after which he ordered the man to get out of the car and look sharp about it. After which, he ordered the man to get out the car and look sharp about it. Shall I come with you, sir? No. Presently, he drove off at terrific speed down the drive and out into the road. Gates looked after him and shook his head. He'll be, he'll break his blooming neck one of these days, he confided gloomily to the gardener. Matherson drove furiously for some way, till the morning freshness gradually soothed the rage in his veins and calmed him. His first passion faded, but the desire for revenge remained. As he drove, he thought how he could best punish Lynn and Pansy, and then he remembered Buster. He would send the boy away, as he had threatened. Ramston had broken his part of their bargain by meeting Pansy last night, and therefore he was at perfect liberty to break his and send Buster to boarding school. It would teach Pansy a lesson. It would, it would bring her to her senses and make her more careful and dutiful in the future. It was odd that the desire to be rid of his wife had never come to him, perhaps because he realized that he could more effectively punish her in other ways. He reached a part of the road where the ways divided, one leading to Chiswell's, and the other away from it to the station. He brought the car to an abrupt standstill, and for a moment sat at the wheel, staring up at the signpost before him. To Chiswell's. An unpleasant smile crossed his face. He was in that state of mind which necessitates a quarrel with someone, and it occurred to him that it would be rather pleasing to see Lynn Ramson's face when he told them that he no longer considered himself bound by their agreement. He swung the car round and drove the remaining mile to Chiswell's. It was not yet half past eight, and most of the blinds were still drawn, and the walls surrounding the grounds were plastered with bills, announcing the forthcoming sale of furniture. He drove up to the door and tugged at the bell. Mr. Ramsden in? Yes, sir, but I don't think he's down yet. The housekeeper, the only one of the staff left, looked at him and instinctively backed away a step. If you'll be pleased to come in, sir, I'll tell Mr. Ramsden, 
he said again. Matherson walked past her into the house. He had forgotten everything in his still muddled state, except that Ramsden had stolen Pansy's love for her, from him. He rather fancied himself in the role of a jealous husband. He was going to show Ramsden that he was not to be intimidated. He was going to show him who was master as he had shown Joyce Lindsay last night. He had been too weak with everyone all along. It would have been a great deal better if he had kept a tight hand on his household. He would show his authority by defying Ramsden and sending Buster to boarding school. He strode up and down and felt himself to be a very fine fellow indeed. The door opened then, and Lynn walked into the room. Ah, good morning, Matherson said. Lynn looked up and down with hard eyes. What do you want? he demanded. Matherson did not answer, and Lynn shut the door and came forward. What do you want? he asked again. What do you mean by coming to my house? Matherson moved back a step. You've broken your word to me, he said arrogantly, and so I came to tell you that I consider myself at liberty to break mine. What do you mean? What I say, you met my wife last night. Lynn changed color. It was an accident. She was with her sister. We hardly exchanged half a dozen words. Mrs. Matherson is not in the least to blame. Matherson laughed. <laughs> No blame the night errant, he sneered. Well, it won't go down with me, I can tell you. I say and I know that you met my wife last night by appointment. And I say that it is a damned lie. Matherson shrugged her shoulders. <laughs> if it is, though I don't admit it, then wear quits, he said cynically. Because you lied to me when you said my wife did not care for because you lied to me when you said my wife did not care for you. He waited, but Ramston said nothing, and he went on, his sense of injustice rising with every word. You made love to her last night. I saw it in her face when she came in, when I questioned her. Lynn broke in agitatedly. Matherson, I swear to you, on my sacred word of honor, that we did not exchange half a dozen words, and that there was nothing said which the whole world might not have heard. He saw the sort of mood Matherson was in, and though his strongest impulse was to knock him down and half choke the life out of him, yet for Pansy's sake he knew he must keep his temper. Mrs. Matherson was not... Mrs. Matherson was not with me for five minutes after Violet left us, he went on, and I have never been been near your house since I gave you my word that I would stay away. I have not seen Mrs. Matherson until last night, when you made good use of a very convenient accident, I've no doubt, Matherson sneered. She came into the house after her very harmless conversation with you and fainted at my feet. I say that you've broken your word, and therefore I feel perfectly justified in breaking mine. Lynn took a quick step forward, his face distorted with passion. By doing what? he demanded. Matherson shrugged his shoulders, probably by telling her the truth, or part of it, that you paid me twenty thousand pounds not to divorce her and leave her on your hands. You hound! Lynn was gray with fury, and his hands were clenched till the knuckles stood out stiff and white through his brown skin. You hound! he said again hoarsely. For a moment, the two men faced each other. Then Lynn's self-control snapped. He hurled himself at Matherson and bore him to the ground. All the pent-up rage and suffering of the past two... All the pent-up rage and suffering of the past weeks seemed to be let loose like wild beasts in that one second, and his hands were at Matherson's throat when the realization of what he was doing came rushing home to him through all his mad passion. His grasp relaxed, and he stumbled to his feet. He was shaking in every limb, and he could hardly speak. Get up, he said quickly. Get up and go before I kill you. Matherson picked himself up as best he could. His collar had burst open, and his lip was cut and bleeding. His eyes were glazed with fury as he reeled past Ramsden to the door. He opened it and stood clinging to the handle and swaying giddily. By God, you shall pay for this, he said hoarsely. You shall pay for this, both of you. And he went out. Lynn crossed the room mechanically and picked up a chair that had been overturned in the struggle. His breath broke from him in little harsh gasps, and he passed a shaking hand across his eyes, as if to brush away the passion that was rending him. Presently, he opened the door and went out into the hall. The front door stood wide, and the remarks on the gravel drive where Matherson had turned the car about and driven away. Lynn stood staring at them for a moment. Then, in a flash, he recalled Matherson's last infuriated words. You shall pay for this, both of you! That meant Pansy as well. His heart seemed to stop beating, then to rush on again unevenly. What would he do, that brute? What could he do? Strike her, perhaps, as he had struck her before, or take the boy away? Mrs. Gee came timidly into the hall and looked at him with scared eyes. Breakfast is ready, sir. He turned round. 
Breakfast. I, I don't want any breakfast. I'm going out. He went down to the yard and started up a car standing there, which belonged to a man who had come over about the sale. Tom Tinker came running after him, but for once in his life, Lynn repulsed the dog. Oh, get away. His nerves were on edge, and he hardly knew what he was doing. All his thoughts were with Pansy, and what would happen when Matherson got back. It was his own fault this time, for having lost his temper. He must follow Matherson, and overtake him, and conciliate him, eat humble pie, apologize, do anything to save Pansy from this threatened... Do anything to save Pansy from his threatened vengeance. That such a man should be allowed to live. His heart was a torment of hatred and, and fear as he raced along the narrow lanes. He remembered the great speed at which Matherson usually drove and spurred his car to greater effort. To overtake him before he reached Green Gables was all he cared about, but he covered two miles of the way without a sign of the car he was pursuing. He was almost inside of the house when over a curving hedge he saw a little cloud of gray dust, evidently raised by a car traveling at high speed, and his pulses quickened. There was still some hope then. He rounded the bend at breakneck pace and sighted Matherson ahead of him. For a quarter of a mile he dashed on, now and then overtaking him a little, and then losing a little. Almost blinded by the dust Matherson was raising, there were but a few yards from the drive of Green Gables when the car ahead of him swerved violently and seemed to turn halfway round before it came to a shivering standstill enveloped in such a swirl of dust from the dry road that for a moment nothing could be clearly seen. Lynn rammed on his brakes, narrowly avoiding a collision, and stopped abreast of it, flung open and, stopping abreast of it, flung open the door and leapt out. Matherson! Then he gave a great cry. Oh, oh my God! And rushing forward, fell on his knees by a little motionless body that had evidently been struck by the bonnet of Matherson's car and then flung clear. Oh my God! Buster! Buster! Matherson was beside him, his face the color of ashes, his big body shaking as if with ague. When he tried to speak, it was in little staccato jerks, broken and hysterical. Here, he ran out. I tried to avoid him. He seemed to run clear into me. He's not hurt, is he? He ran out. He's not hurt, is he? I tried to avoid him. Over and over again, the same parrot-like cry. Lynn had lifted the boy in his arms, the pretty head falling back heavily against his breast. Through. There was no color in the little face, save for an ugly, disfiguring bruise on the temple where the, the slow blood was beginning to flow. Buster! Buster! He felt the limp little figure jerk stiffly, and for an instant, Buster opened his eyes with infinite difficulty, looking up into Lynn's ghastly face, and the tiniest shadow of a smile crossed his lips. Oh, oh, sunny boy, sunny boy! Lynn broke it out in an anguish. What? What? So deep! Buster whispered and died. That's the end of chapter 23 of The Matheson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Thank you for listening to that chapter with me. Um, I'm, I'm still processing this. I hope that you come back soon to figure out how the rest of the story goes. And I hope that your day is going better than the day of the characters in this book. Bye!